Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. We're doing a split show today with two interesting topics. Later on in the show, we're going to talk to the owners of two independent pharmacies about uh, the challenges facing that industry, but how some are still still making their way in a time of big chains and big corporations and kind of how that part of the industry works is something people have been talking about a lot. But first, we're going to dive into the legal profession, a topic uh, we've discussed a few times on this show with different folks. And today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Gina LeMay. She is the immediate past president, president ex officio of the Rhode Island Women's Bar Association, and from, also from the Rhode Island Bar, Women's Bar Association, they're Vice President Kelly Kincaid. Gina Kelly, thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. So first, um, I assume these are volunteer positions, uh, as no. these usually are, so you both have day jobs. Just tell us briefly um, where you work in the daytime and what your specialty is in the law. Um, I'm an associate at the Law Office of William Conley, and we focus a lot on municipal and government work, but we're a general civil litigation practice. Okay, so that's Gina. And Kelly, what's, uh, what's your I'm shingle? an associate at Adler, Pollock & Sheehan, and I am in the civil litigation department. We do lots of different things. Um, we have corporate department, uh, business, uh, litigation, lots of lots of things. APS, one of the big ones yeah. uh, there, and, yeah. and Senator Conley, one of the medium ones. So I, say, I won't say a small one. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't yeah. want to get the senator mad. <laughs> um, so I wanted to have you both on. You just recently had your uh, big meeting of the Women's Bar Association. Um, people hear a lot about the Rhode Island Bar Association, which is all lawyers, but of course this is specifically for women in the field. How long, uh, Jean, I'll start with you, has the Women's Bar Association been around and kind of what's its mission? Sure. Um, we actually were looking into that this year just to get a little bit more of our history. Um, I spoke with Karen Davidson, who's a practitioner in Rhode Island, and she was the first president. And based on her recollection, it was the late 80s, early 90s that they kind of started to convene a women's bar association. And the purpose at that time was to have a forum for women to discuss issues that were pertinent to them. There are issues that women face in balancing careers and family and just being a minority in the profession. And they wanted to kind of have a forum to discuss that, bring judges in to speak on different um, continuing education matters and to just have a resource in one another. So I would say probably since the late 80s, early 90s, we've been an organization. And Kelly, you're vice president, so you've uh, taken a leadership role here. What was what is the appeal when you, you know, at your, your lawyers are usually pretty busy to begin with, so they don't always have a lot of extracurricular time, yeah. but this is something you've prioritized. Why was this an organization you felt you wanted to devote time to? Because my friend was a part of the organization. <laughs> Gina had um, <laughs> I think joined the year before I did, and um, it was just a good group of women, and it was a way to meet other practitioners, potentially doing other types of work, but also um, learning from the older and the more wise uh, female mm -hmm. attorneys in our um, organization, and so it was just a great organization to get involved in and, and kind of expand your practice and meet new people. and. Um, it's been an invaluable resource for us. You said Gina's your friend. Are you calling her older, or are you saying she, just your friend? <laughs> I'm the more friend? senior. <laughs> more senior. senior yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned um, <clears throat> being a minority in the profession. I, what roughly, not asking you for exact figures, right. but how? What percentage of the bar in Rhode Island is women today versus men? Is it is it getting closer to even? Is it still very outnumbered? Well, so what's interesting is no one really tracks that data, and part of. Um, some of the work we've done as an organization along with Roger Williams Law School and their research staff is trying to figure out who some of the first women were. The Bar Association, which is the mandatory um, membership for all attorneys, doesn't keep data as to male versus female. So we don't know. We know that more than 50% of um, graduating classes from law school are females. But we're not seeing these, those same numbers within firms or on the judiciary. Um, so we're not, we don't know if we're quite at 50% yet. Yeah, because when I think of the managing partners at the big right. law firms, or as you say, the judiciary, there are of course many many esteemed women judges, but right. I still would think there's more men than women. I have never not You're counted correct. myself. Um, you've seen also a significant increase in your membership um, in the past year, do you find is there something driving that that you hear from new members about why they want to be a part of this and more more awareness, more of a sense we need to band together? I think it's awareness. I think we've worked really hard as a board. I've been on the board since um, about 2007, and as new members have come on, we've worked really hard to increase the quality of our programs, to reach out to more than just the known firms, to smaller firms 
to those in government service, to get everyone involved and to have programs that appeal to a broad range. So I think um, that in our word of mouth, as more people have gotten involved and start saying, hey, you really should join the Women's Bar. It's a great organization. They come to an event and they like what we're doing. I think that's helped increase our membership. Kelly, um, you know, when we think about specific challenges that women face, some people are watching and say, well, you're all lawyers, male or female. There must be many similar challenges. But what are some of the things that come up frequently when you're all meeting, when you're having conversations, when you have speakers in that, that seems to be uniquely felt by the women in this profession? Well, I think the balance of raising a family um, and being a full-time attorney is extremely difficult. Um, you know, some firms and some uh, positions are more flexible in how they deal with that balance, but I know that that's like a number one issue for a lot of women. Um, and also, uh, you know, especially in the in the firm setting, women trying to break into um, roles where they can have client contact and develop their own book of business. Um, I know that's a- Can you explain that for, because some people at home won't know exactly why that was important, what that means. Sure, explain that, yeah. why that's valuable. In the sense, in, in my experience, um, and I'm, I've worked for medium and, and larger firms, um, as a young associate, you come in and you're kind of the workhorse and you do all the grunt work. You don't necessarily have a lot of point of contact with the clients and, um, I know a lot of clients now, they would like to see more women involved in, in, in doing their work, going to court for them, negotiating settlements, nego negotiating resolutions. Um, so I think that is a challenge um, and it's almost like a business model challenge as well for firms to kind of try to pull in uh, the females and get them more involved in cases, more involved in client contacts so that you can then transfer either the files to them and help them broaden their business and broaden their um, skills. Um, that Those are two big challenges I think that um, women kind of have to face. So neither of you I would say are, are, are older um, women lawyers, but you mentioned, mm -hmm. Gina, that you talk to um, the women who have a lot, we'll say a lot more experience, mm -hmm. many maybe decades in the field. Yes. What is the sense? Has it gotten, uh, have good steps been taken to make the law in Rhode Island more friendly to women, more able to, to do the work-life balance issues that you mentioned, Kelly, but other issues as well? I definitely think there's been uh, huge steps, and I think a lot of the women that have come before us have um, made a lot of sacrifices to make that happen. They've made their voices known, they've stepped up and become leaders within the industry, which has opened doors for us. But um, I think there's still a lot of ways to go. I mean, there's often times, and I think Kelly can speak to this too, we're in court mediations, client meetings, and we are the only females at the table. I mean, there are often you know five, six other men, and it's just us. And I think it's it's a cultural change that has to continue to happen. And I think we're seeing more appointments to females in the judiciary as well, which I think is important. And I think a lot of the judges do a good job of trying to. Um, help females along in the profession and be mentors to us. There are, our female members of the judiciary are very available to us as practitioners um, in social settings such as this and they've been mentors and I think that gives us the confidence to keep going, keep trying to make changes. All right, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we're gonna talk more with Gina LeMay and Kelly Kincaid about the Rhode Island Women's Bar Association and for you budding lawyers out there, we're gonna ask, should you spend all that money on law school? Stick with us on Executive Suite. Executive Suite, um, Ted Nisi. Later on in the show, we're going to be talking to the leaders of two independent pharmacies about how that industry has changed as more bigger and bigger corporations and chains have come along there. So that's coming up. But right now, very pleased to continue the conversation with Gina LeMay. She's the immediate past president, president ex officio of the Round Women's Bar Association and the association's vice president, Kelly Kincaid. They are both, of course, attorneys themselves. And I was reading uh, a write-up you folks put together, Gina, uh, about the activities of the Bar Association to get up to speed. And I was stunned by a story told right off the top about the first woman lawyer in Rhode Island. Will you briefly tell people at home who might not know that bit of history? Sure. Ada Sawyer was the first female um, attorney admitted to the Bar in Rhode Island in 1920. 1920. So 1920. No, all those hundreds of years, colonial times and on, no, no women females. lawyers till her. No. And Ada um, studied the law under another attorney. At that time, you could read the law. So she didn't even go to law school, but she studied under... Um, um, under another attorney in Rhode Island and he had to petition on her behalf to the Rhode Island Supreme Court because at the time the rules of admission to the bar did not consider women to fall in the definition of person. So he had to petition the Supreme Court and only after they issued an opinion saying women could 
be members of the bar was she admitted to the bar and in she's 1920. now the name of your uh, award you get yeah right? so every year the Rhode Island Women's Bar Association at its annual dinner gives the Ada Sawyer um, award to a woman that is in the legal profession um, who we think emulates Ada's um, characteristic, helps promote the status of women in the legal profession, but in our communities in Rhode Island as well. So your theme um, recently has been investing in women, uh, which makes sense, of course, for the organization. How, put some meat on the bones with that. What what specifically have been asks or ideas or things that, that people, your members really feel like could make a difference, bring up more women and give them more opportunities? Um, so this year, our CLE series, we try to do a CLE series every spring. For um, people at home, that's yes. continuing legal education which Correct. all the lawyers have to do every yes, year. Yes, we do. We have to get 10 credits um, every year. So the Women's Bar Association for several years now has put on a CLE series. We've been fortunate to have Lock Lord host it um, for several years now. And this year we were, we were focusing on ways women can invest in themselves, but how others can too. So we talked about um, the gender wage gap and how to negotiate effectively for yourself because there are differences in the way that women need to negotiate effective communication and leadership, how to sit at the table and make your voice heard and not discriminate credit yourself because often there are actually language tools that women use that discredit themselves and just little words that we don't even know realize we're using. Um, so we had a speech coach, coach and visibility strategist Lauren Capizo who um, owns her own business here come in and speak to our members about that. So just ways that you can recognize your worth and realize that you do have the skills to be sitting there. Don't discredit yourself because maybe someone else along your path has made you feel that way. How much though is it on men not to allow a woman's perhaps natural way of speaking in a professional setting to discredit, you know, to be discredited, someone has to discredit you. And like, is, I would think it's also incumbent on men maybe to, to look differently than they have in the past. Oh, I think so. I think it's an awareness thing. And I think it is on everyone to do better, but I do think it's on women to not allow it to happen to themselves in that we know we know the answers it's okay to speak up and say it and not feel like there's this syndrome called imposter syndrome and many women suffer from it where they think okay i'm here i am skilled but i really shouldn't speak up i shouldn't say it and we have to start training ourselves not to do that because we deserve to be there just as much as anyone else so kelly i said i was going to ask i have to ask <laughs> but you there's no doubt you it's graduation season as we okay. tape this i'm sure you're getting it from uh, college students and others who know you when you get that question law school it's a lot of money it's a big time commitment uh there's a lot of lawyers in the Northeast. What is your advice today to young people or to parents whose, whose own young people are thinking about it? What do you say today? Um, I, I would say you really have to think about it. Uh, most of the people that I know that I went to law school with, everyone's life path kind of was delayed a bit because you're in school longer, you have other, other things going on. Um, the people that don't go to graduate school or don't go to law school, they're probably getting married, they're probably buying houses, they're probably having families before you. So it's a big commitment and it kind of maybe might turn you in a different path um, along the way. So just really sit there and, and think about it. And it is a lot of money. You en end up graduating with a mortgage payment and you have no house. Um, <laughs> so it is a, a big, you know, a big thing to think about. But what do I regret doing it? Absolutely not. I met fabulous, amazing people in law school, um, lifelong friends. Yes. Uh, we, we were Rhode Islanders and, as and well, we yeah. didn't know each other and then we met in law school. Yeah. Which um, law school? Uh, Suffolk. Suffolk. <laughs> Um, so I would recommend it. Um, it. It's an amazing profession, and, um, and it's an amazing place to practice in Rhode Island. Do you echo that, or are you saying, no, don't go? No, I do. <laughs> I just, I think you have to, like, as Kelly said, think really seriously about the investment. It's not a just a grad school where you're thinking, okay, you know, I'll continue my education. It's the time, the commitment, and then the career path after, you know? I mean, there's, there's, you're restricted to where you can practice based on where you pass the bar and that doesn't always I mean you can try to wave into other states but that doesn't always lead you to other opportunities that other professions might so just don't just do it because you think oh I can just go to school for a little bit longer it really is a, um, a lifelong commitment so be serious about it what's your favorite thing about being a lawyer your lawyer can get a bad right you know how some of the television shows yeah. treat lawyers yeah. and some of the public perception from those yeah. of us who aren't lawyers what's your favorite thing about your chosen profession 
I like the diversity of what our practice does. I'm doing something different every day, you know, dealing with different clients on a variety of issues. And I think um, allowing myself to think differently in different capacities, whether in court or in a mediation um, or negotiations, I think I like the challenges that we face on a daily basis. How about for you, Kelly? I think it's um, actually mentoring younger mm -hmm. attorneys. Um, we, the Women's Bar Associ Association has on occasion partnered with the law school um, and had mentorship programs um, through the years. Uh, and also just dealing with new associates or summer associates or law clerks um, over the years. I think dealing with them and trying to help them through the process because it's hard when you graduate. You you know go to school for all this time and you take the bar and you, you all of a sudden land a job and you pretty much know zero. Um, so it's difficult. It's a difficult transition um, and I like being a part of helping these young attorneys, you know, find their way. So. Well, if they're watching, they might be sending you an email tonight uh, asking for a little mentorship. All right, Gina LeMay and Kelly Kincaid from the Round Women's Bar Association, thank you both for joining me. Don't go away though, because coming up next, we're going to talk to the owners of two independent pharmacies about that industry and its challenges and opportunities circa 2019. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and as I said on the second half here, we're going to talk with a bit about independent pharmacies. You know, we all know the nostalgic picture of the, the local druggist. Uh, you think of It's a Wonderful Life, uh, though of course he, he wasn't always the best druggist. Now that I think about it, but we'll forget that piece of the movie. Um, there aren't as many as there used to be, and there are a lot of big chains. So we want to talk a little about the industry. And so we have kind of two ends of the spectrum here. Howell Smith, the third, he is the president and owner of Howell Smith Druggist in Pawtucket, which is just closed its pharmacy in May uh, 2019 after many decades of business. Famous um, there on, on Newport Ave, right? Uh, in Pawtucket. Yep, we all know the sign. And Brooke Van Egan, she's the owner of Van Egan's Pharmacy, which just recently opened in Cranston. So Brooke and Howell, thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. So Howell, let me start with you. People, we have some video we're going to show, uh, and people, if they don't recognize the name, are going to instantly recognize your sign. Tell me a little about your family's history with Howell Smith Druggist, as well as, of course, your own involvement there. Okay, well, my grandfather started the business in 1937 uh, with my grandmother. She was not a pharmacist, but obviously his helper. Um, they ran the business for years, and then my father and mother, they met in pharmacy school. He was Howell J. Smith, Jr., and my mother was Janet Smith. Um, they met in pharmacy school, and um, they took the accelerated program because my father went into the service. Um, they worked with my grandmother and grandfather for years, and then in 1967 they built, they tore down the, the tenement buildings, which you know your typical little corner pharmacy, and 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 turned it into a 3,500 square foot store, um, and which you can see is there today. Um, and in 1977 I graduated from pharmacy school, and I went to work as a pharmacist there and uh, that's where I've been working ever since. Did you ever think twice about following in the family footsteps? It was yes. always clear. You did, yeah. <laughs> what made you decide to do it? Um, at one point I, I was going to go into dentistry, um, but when I considered you know, how much debt I would be in, <laughs> at the end I figured, well, I might as well stick it out and, and make, it, make, it, make it go. But, uh, that was, that was after I became a pharmacist. But, uh. So as I mentioned, you've decided to close. There's a lot of people um, saddened to hear oh, it. Um, incredible. You, you had a huge outpouring, I believe, huge. people coming in. Tell us a little about what it's been like. Uh, it's, it's been like a funeral. <laughs> you know, uh, I've heard it described that way, but you know, at some, at some points there were people lined up all the way out the door. You know, come and say hi, hugs, kisses, crying. Yeah. It was um, very, very emotional. And so what, what was, in the end, I mean, mm -hmm. people are well aware, they know there's a CVS and a Walgreens on every corner, mm -hmm. and sometimes people say they're surprised to see ones that, that lasted as long yeah. as Howell Smith Druggist did. Yeah. What, in the end, were the pressures that made you decide, it's just, it's time, it's, we're going to hang up the shingle for now, it's, it's just not going to, we're not going to continue? It was, um, it was the reimbursements by the, um, what they call PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, who run the insurance company, who, 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 yeah, basically run the insurance for, you know, pharmacies and for the people. And for people at home, PBMs, arcane to the average person, but enormously powerful in this enormously. industry. And they're, um, they live in a shroud of secrecy and no one can penetrate it. 
So there's no transparency whatsoever. Uh, it's really a shame. Uh, and what's the day-to-day -day impact so people understand of PBM? It's, it's how much you get paid, right? Right. It's as simple as that. Yeah. I mean, you want to provide a service, you want to be paid for it. Uh, unfortunately, these PBMs, they tell you what you can charge. They, uh, they have all sorts of rules and regulations. They audit you looking for little clerical errors, not, not on prescriptions that cost you 5 or $10, but they look for $100 or more. So, anything, so if, they catch you, if they, they catch you with a you know, $100 prescription that you filled 12 times and there was one little clerical error on you, they take it all back. Mm. They take it all back, unless you can prove that it was okay. But uh, you know, it's that, it's that those little nitpicky things. They're clerical errors that have nothing to do with health. And just before I turn to Brooke, did you feel, uh, you know, you've been personally in it, uh, the squeeze more and more in recent years? Uh, the squeeze has been incredible. Uh, you know, I was got to the point where I, I couldn't pay my wholesaler. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So Brooke, people are going to hear that and think <laughs> you're crazy. Why are you opening an independent pharmacy? Okay, so I, it's been a dream of mine for a really long time, like going back to pharmacy school. I graduated pharmacy school. I worked at hospitals in the area for a little while. I joined the Air Force, and I, was a, uh, I worked as a pharmacist in the Air Force for eight years. I'm still in the Air Force Reserve, but when I got out, I wanted to go back home and serve my community, and I wanted to open up a store and do what I wanted to do all along. So that's what, that's what I did. Um, maybe through some slightly rose-colored glasses and maybe a little bit of uh, misinformation about the current climate in the reimbursement realm. Um, so uh, we're struggling through it right now. Yeah, so I, I could echo everything he said. It's, um, it's a anti-competitive isn't a strong enough word for it. It's a, it's a hostile climate is what it is, where if you can picture an, a, a, an industry where your direct competitor is allowed to set not only drug prices and the price of the, the product that you're acquiring, but then also set your reimbursement. And then they'll set that lower than perhaps the oh, drug Brooke, cost. Your uh, hair is hitting your microphone, and I want people to be able to focus on what you're okay. saying. Okay. Keep going with what you're saying. It's important. Yes. So they, can, they set the price of the drug. They can set your reimbursement for the drug. And then a few months down the road, they can come back and assess a DIR fee onto that product, which will sometimes drive you into a negative reimbursement situation. So it's... Um, I don't know any other industry that can thrive in that setting. So we it's hard. only have a little time left. People are going to people hear this. They might say, "Well, maybe I will try an independent pharmacy. I don't want to be unfair." Yeah. Uh, Thirty seconds left. Can they use their insurance? Can they uh, get all the drugs they think they need yeah. in an independent pharmacy? Absolutely. Make your pitch. So we take insurance, <laughs> all insurances. Uh, we really support the patients. So what we hear over and over again is that they like that we know their name when they walk in the door. We know their sometimes their dogs, their kids, their spouses. We know what they're taking. We know what they need. Um, we answer the phone when you call stuff like that um, and and it's that personal touch that you can't get at a big chain where you kind of feel like a number on a wheel. All right well Brooke Van Egan making a go of it and Cranston <laughs> and Howell Smith finishing out a long and proud legacy with your family. Congratulations on all those years serving the people of Pawtucket and around and Howell Smith and thank you for joining us on this week's edition of Executive Suite. Remember you can catch every episode of the show on our website WPRI.com or as a podcast on iTunes. We'll see you back here next week on Executive Suite.